Hello, this is Kerry Schutz with MathWorks, and this is video two discussing the cross spectrum to auto spectrum based transfer function measurement. And in this video, what I want to do is go over um, the measurement and the model configuration, the signal processing in more detail than I did in the first video. So in the first video, I did a quick pass through of the model in terms of the signal processing. Uh, and then I show the uh, spectrum analyzer results, magnitude and phase response uh, for a particular uh, use case. Okay, so we're using the same device under test, the same um, measurement parameters in this model. So nothing has changed as far as that goes. It's more of we're just going to step through how it works in more detail. So let's start with the left side of the model where we're setting up the excitation and we're setting up the measurement noise. These blocks in Simulate come are really from the same library. It's called a random source block. The only thing different about them is that we configure them just slightly different. And that slight difference is actually key to making the whole thing work. OK, so in the excitation, uh, it's, it has a Gaussian distribution for the noise, zero mean unit variance, an initial seed of 123, and a sample time of 1 over fs. Now that FS here is our sample rate. It was set in a MATLAB function that was called when the model was loaded. Uh, I've got a link to it right here. It's called preload function dot M. It happens to be 25.6 kilohertz for the sample rate. Therefore, the sample time is just one over that. Okay. The key parameter here really I want you to pay attention to is the initial seed of 123. Not its absolute value, just its relative value. And I'll look and now. Here are the measurement noise, same block, it's almost same everything for the configuration, except for the initial seed is different at four, five, six. Now that's pretty important to get right. And it's something that would be easy to make a mistake on in a simulation, you know, a simulation environment like Simulate. Uh, it would be very difficult to make a mistake if you were making this uh, measurement in the lab on the bench. Essentially, what we're doing here in the simulation is we're making sure that whatever we set up for our excitation, this would be likely uh, some arbitrary waveform, random noise waveform. Perhaps you generated it using a tool like MATLAB or otherwise. Maybe your function generator already has an, a random noise, a function generate capability. And you're just setting it to say, hey, output a, an excitation using random noise. Um, and of course, the measurement noise in your system and your measurement electronics, uh, your spectrum analyzer, network analyzer, or in your electronics, perhaps in your device under test, you would not expect that noise to be synchronized or correlated with your function generator arbitrary waveform, random noise excitation. And so you just want to make sure in your model, when you're setting up, you don't merely copy and paste your excitation up here to be measurement noise and rename it uh, because it's not going to work very well, the measurement, and it won't work for the worse, not for the better. Okay. And again, that measurement noise also is not going to be something you would add on purpose in the model, most likely, unless you were doing, you know, perhaps experiments on measurement noise. Uh, it would be noise inherent in the system. It'd be inherent noise here in the electronics and the measurement hardware. Uh, something that was probably distributed. Uh, it could be, come from different sources, quantization noise, thermal noise. And it were just merely modeling the overall effect by co-locating it in one spot in our simulate model here in the upper left is measurement noise. And I band limited it out, the measurement noise out to 100 kilohertz. That's pretty much an arbitrary decision. I just chose it to be some bandwidth greater than the device under test, or, the, or I should say greater than the uh, bandwidth of analysis, which is 10 kilohertz on this one kilohertz notch filter. Okay, so we we now we have um, the noise, again, adding uh, to the device under test output. Uh, and so we have our noisy measurement uh, on the response channel. And we have a uh, lower noise, you could say, measurement on the reference channel, uh, since again, we know uh, we're in exact control over this excitation. Although it is random noise in terms of its distribution, it is deterministic random noise. And it's deterministic because, well, if you specify the random seed, every time uh, you start the experiment or play the waveform out, the noisy waveform out, it will be the exact same shall we say, noisy waveform, a very predictable one. OK, so now we've got um, our two inputs to our uh, network analyzer response and, um, and reference, our you know, band-limited excitation. And now a, this is a similar story to what we discussed uh, in the previous video. We can kind of we want to step through this, but we want to go in a little more detail. And the other thing I want to do before we go any further 
is just reemphasize that this is a mixed signal model, although it may not appear to be the case at just this view of the system. I'm going to turn on sample time colors, and we're going to see that there are a discrete time rates, two of them in the model, and a continuous time portion of the model here with the black signal lines. So the red is the 25.6 kilohertz rate, the green is the 25 hertz rate, and the black is continuous time. And the and going under this block, this will tell us even more. This is the transition between the red and the green, those two rates. In fact, all of the rates, we go from continuous to the fast sample rate or the faster sample rate of 25.6 kilohertz, and then we go to the slower rate of 25 hertz. However, it's really not fast versus slow in this model because the, dis, the, uh, the separator is a buffer block. So what we're really showing here is we're going from a sample time, sample based signal at 25.6 kilohertz to a frame based or vector based signal, I should say, at 25 hertz. So this is the frame or buffer update rate, which of course is going to be slower than the individual samples. And it's slower by whatever, by whatever uh, the buffer size is. That'll be the distinguishing uh, factor. Uh, and that, that factor in this case is the FFT size, which is 1024. We can also backspace over this. And if we do that, it's gonna provide, it says, hey, did you mean this variable? I said, yes, I did. And it means it's 1024. We can also just go into the MATLAB environment, see it's in the workspace of 1024, uh, or we could go to uh, our uh, directory where this model is, and we've got a preload function where all these variables were set and you can also see it there as 1024. So many ways to see um, how big that buffer size or is. Now, if we go back to the model, there's actually even an easier way. I've just showed you three quick ways. Uh, there's also a fourth way, which is a lot of people like to use, and that is turn on signal annotation in the model and it, turn on signal dimensions in particular, and it will tell you right there on the signal lines 1024. So now we got sample time colors on, so sample rate information. We've also got signal dimensions signal sizes on. Moving right along, again, we've got symmetry between the response and uh, reference paths. Uh, we'll just move along the, um, uh, let's say the reference path. We, we, hand, we apply a hand window and we FFT. So the hand window is there because we are applying, in this case, random noise as the excitation. And that random noise in this particular case is uh, non-periodic meaning over every FFT uh, frame, it does not repeat itself. It's not in some way periodic or repetitive. So again, this is where uh, the hand window comes in. If we want to minimize the effect of spectral leakage, uh, you should go with the hand window or a, at least a non boxcar window. I'll, I'll say it's, it's important. Uh, for other types of excitations we'll see like chirp, that's a different story, but for this non-periodic signal, it's going to be different in FF, every FFT frame. The excitation will be different. Uh, you should use a, um, a, a non, I'll call it boxcar non retinal window. Then that 1024 point window goes to our 1024 point FFT. Uh, and that 1024 point FFT is, uh, shall we say, uh, subselected or pruned down to 400 uh, bins, the first 400 bins of the FFT. And then the reason for that is, uh, is that we have a real signal and real signals have conjugate symmetry in, in the frequency domain. And so therefore we could only go down to 512 or 513 FFT bins. We're gonna go, that is zero to FS over two, as opposed to plus and minus FS over two. However, we further uh, uh, trim down even further, prune down further to just 400 instead of 512. And so the reason for that is basically the, um, bandwidth of analysis. Our excitation uh, bandwidth is only over 10 kilohertz. So there's no point in really analyzing the data from 10 kilohertz out to FS over two at 12.8 kilohertz. Okay, that extra 2.8 kilohertz is uh, not gonna really have any meaningful signal uh, or response to analyze. So what we do, if you look at the 10 kilohertz, whoops, uh, let me just get rid of that. Oh, we don't need that, whoops. Let's take the, uh, 10 kilohertz and divide it by 25.6 kilohertz, we get 0 0.390625. And if we were to take 400 divided by 1024, we'll get that same um, fraction. So again, that's why we're doing it. We're just picking out the 10 kilohertz portion out of the total FFT uh, range or the F plus and minus FS over two. 
Okay, so now we've got, and, and the nice benefit of that, of course, is also that now we have uh, less processing to do uh, going forward or downstream here, as opposed to processing 512 or 1024 bins on each channel, we're only processing uh, 400. Okay, so now here's the interesting part. Uh, this is the auto spectrum and the cross spectrum computation. So a number of ways to look at this, but as I said in the previous video, what we're essentially doing is we're trying to separate the effect of the measurement noise on the response from the excitation on the response. We want the effect of the excitation on the response. We do not want the effect of the measurement on the response. The, I'm sure the measurement noise, I should say, on the response. And so the cross spectrum is the way we do that. It's the great separator of these two effects uh, on the response. And again, it really boils down to just this one product here I have labeled product four, this vector product where we're taking a 400 by one signal, multiplying it by another 400 by one signal spectrum in each case, forming a 400 by one cross spectrum estimate output. Okay. So what again exactly is that cross spectrum again? A cross spectrum is by definition a Fourier transform of a cross of the cross correlation function. So they're uh, Fourier transform pairs. And so in terms, if you look at it in terms of cross correlation as opposed to cross spectrum, uh, the, th that is what, and what are we taking the cross correlation of? Well, reference and response, these two signal lines here and here. And, and cross correlation is really a similarity measure, let's say, a, a uh, measure of similarity or commonality between those two signals. And what do those two signals have in common? Well, only one thing, the device under test, that which we are trying to characterize in this transfer function measurement exercise. Okay, uh, the, these two signals do not have the measurement noise in common. So by definition, it gets weeded out in the process, or at least again, because we don't have them as correlated signals, uh, they are weeded out. Now, maybe its effect is not completely diminished. There'll be some incidental correlation between them, but for the most part, they are core the measurement noise effect is correlated out at this node in the system okay so that's the good news all right so so there so now we have is how we say a diminished or greatly diminished effect of the measurement noise at this point at this point as opposed to this point where you have plenty of measurement noise and then the question is what about the top part what portion does it serve them uh the top portion the auto spectrum is the great normalizer or great yeah you could call it that in the model where it really has the um, the great benefit of reducing um, or, or improving the measurement in a number of ways. One of those ways is just getting the measurement scaled correctly. OK, uh, we don't have a sense of scaling if we just measure the cross spectrum here. OK, we'll have probably the shape of the of the response or the magnitude and phase. Right. But we don't necessarily have the um, the details. Uh, of, the, of that right it's just a general shape we we won't know whether the response is it you know should be around 10 db or 20 db or minus 40 db uh, so this brings the measurement in scale when we divide by or normalize by the level of the reference right we need to know the level of the reference so we know how much gain we have at each frequency uh, also it helps improve um, uh, reduces the noise in our measurement as opposed to just looking at the cross spectrum alone okay um, because again, this is a noisy excitation. Uh, we can't count on the reference level to be exactly the same at every frequency over each FFT frame. It's going to be a little different. And so by, by normalizing to whatever precise level we excited at over, at, over every FFT frame or every cross spectrum, now we've effectively uh, reduced the effect of noise on the measurement. Um, it also compensates um, the more subtle effect of this ratioing is that any type of of uh, distortion, uh, particularly you know linear distortion effect that's introduced by things like uh, anti-alias filter ripple in the uh, passband, uh, sample finite sampling effects, zero order hold effects, uh, all of those effects effectively get ratioed out of the measurement because those effects are identical on each path. Okay. If it's an alias filter here with a certain kind of uh, ripple, um, it also has that effect here. So it naturally gets ratioed out here. Uh, you know, same thing with the zero order hold effects. If you have that effect 
on this channel with a zero order hold. You also will have a very, very similar effect on the re response channel, the zero order hold. So that gets kind of ratioed out of the measurement. Uh, so again, the noisy uncertainty gets ratioed out. Uh, the anti-alias filter effects get ratioed out. The sample zero order hold effects get ratioed out. Uh, so a slew of good, uh, bent, nice benefits that you get uh, by introducing this ratio-based measurement approach. And that comes mostly by benefit of that auto spectrum inserted in there, which again, uh, it's a real signal at this point because we've auto, it's an auto spectrum. So it's a conjugate, you know, uh, cross product with itself. Uh, so it doesn't have any impact on the phase, but it does have a huge impact on the quality of the magnitude response measurement. Okay, so moving right along, and what I'm going to do now is just turn off the sample time colors because they're really only good for initial understanding, and then after that, they really just become a source of, uh, you know, <laughs> distraction in the model with all that extra uh, labeling. Um, the one more labeling that I will turn on, uh, just because it, it can also give you insight sometime of what's going on in the model, is base data types right there. And what you'll see now is we go from, we have real signals, on the left, just real uh, double precision data. But then it transitions right here at the FFT block. It goes from double precision to double C. That means from real to complex. Okay, we don't put R for real. We just put C when it's complex. And you'll notice it's complex all the way from there. In fact, all the way to, to where you compute the complex frequency response output of this ratio block before we break it into magnitude and phase. And it goes back to real signals again. Okay, so that, that can also be handy if you're wondering, is it is this an IQ signal, real imaginary, or is it a real signal? Just turn on your uh, uh, data types and it will tell you quickly without going to too much trouble logging signals and looking at them in MATLAB. Okay, so now uh, we've got our auto spectrum cross spec. Now we have this block here, which is call, called spectral averaging. Uh, it's, it's a digital filter block from Simulink, uh, which means that the implementation in this case is actually an IRR filter. It could also be FIR as well. IIR implements exponential averaging. FIR implement would implement what's called a moving average or, or a uh, uh, additive averaging. Okay, either way you want to look at it, the uh, same same uh, eff effect, FIR versus IIR in this case. So we're using exponential or IIR averaging, uh, IIR filtering in this case, and you can see it's a first order filter with particular coefficients. And these this um, these, this p value was set in my MATLAB script earlier. Um, we can also just look at its response right here in the in the dialog. And you can see it's highly slanted toward the low frequency for the DC, and meaning it's a average or you know of computing the mean of that output at each frequency. So what this block does, you could say, is it, and this is probably comes in handy. I, I turn those uh, signal dimensions off, and now I want to turn them back on again, and I will turn the data types off because again, it, you get too many uh, annotations on it gets confusing. We've got this uh, 400 by one, which is hard to see here, input to the digital filter. We also have a 400 by one output. Okay, so how does what does that mean exactly? Uh, we are not averaging each element uh, of these 401 with, within any FFT frame. We are averaging them from one frame to the next. So these this 401 on one cross spectrum or auto spectrum are, are averaged with the previous uh, auto spectrums, okay, 400 by one. So you can think of them as an overlay of all of the um, auto spectrums or cross spectrums, and then you're averaging across them, okay? And that's essentially what we're doing. Uh, you could look at it as 400 parallel IR filters, one for each frequency bin that we're averaging over and forming this average now, cross spectrum and auto spectrum output, which we're ratioing. Again, why are we averaging? We're averaging because, well, we've got a noisy, excitation um, that we're averaging over okay so it's it's now if you have different types of excitation um, less averaging is required but for now for this one this one needs more averaging uh, than does other because it's again not going to have the same levels at each um, at each uh, FFT frame okay so that is mostly all I want to say the rest of it is probably pretty self-explanatory we're just breaking the magnitude and phase and display I should also point out, sorry, before I go, is that if you want more theoretical, this was not obviously a mathematical derivation, uh, formal in any way, uh, for to justify or prove this approach out. Uh, we're doing all of this kind of uh, uh, by uh, 
graphical description uh, and running models and just kind of explaining what the box are doing using words, okay, more than we are math. However, there is a good reference here. If you go to this link, hpmemoryproject.org, you will find an excellent uh, paper on this topic. Uh, let's see, I thought I had it up. Maybe I don't. Um, if so, I can just copy it here. I should be able to go into a web browser. Let's see here. Let's go into a web browser and I will put it in there. Let's see if we can get there. Yeah, here we go. Uh, and if we scroll down, we go all the way to the end of this HP. Um, of course, they're no longer HP. They're not Agilent. They're now Keysight, of course, for some years now. Application note 243, the fundamentals of signal analysis. Go to the last page or one of the last pages and you will find a nice mathematical derivation that goes into more detail on this cross spectrum versus auto spectrum measurement and why it works so well if you want to see all the math. Okay. Um, in short, you go down to right here, it'll say the estimate is this. So it, you get the uh, transfer function of your device under test plus this extra cross um, term. But this cross term is basically zero, the noise and the excitation. So you're basically just left with H of F. Uh, so anyway, feel free to go through that. It, it's a good paper on many fronts, not just not just this appendix on page uh, 64, 65, 66. Uh, I think you'll find it quite handy if you're curious to learn more. Okay, I will leave it there. And uh, in the next video, I think I'll do uh, some experiments. We'll do some more what if uh, using this model. That'll give us a better feel for how the, the model works. Okay, till then, thank you.